Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let us praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hey, y'all. Praise the Lord. I don't know when I've looked forward to Wednesday any more than I have lately. It's been, been a wonderful season uh, for me to come over at the invitation of Ralph and, and the leaders here and share with you and uh, doing so again here for another week. And, uh, you know, I want to just say this to you. I don't really think that Ralph is uh, extending this meeting based on how many people are sitting here. I, I really don't think that's the, I don't think it is, is it? I guess if nobody came, we'd think, well, let's close this thing down. Uh, having said that, though, uh, being trying to be led by the Holy Spirit, you know, just trying to be led by the Holy Spirit, trying to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying about a gathering like this. And we don't try to fill in the blanks ahead of time. I mean, really, we are really trying to evaluate this week by week. And so I hope you'll pray about that, will you? And will you also pray uh, that if the Lord is leading us, it would be not just an opportunity for you to be blessed, but for those who have never walked in these doors, in your circle of influence. Because one thing I know about this, I don't know about the duration of this meeting, but this I do know. This meeting is about the city of Dothan and beyond. That's what it's about. It's about what the Holy Spirit does in your lives, in our lives, in order to become a catalyst for people we don't even yet know. But some you do. Some you do know. In your circle, your sphere of influence. Now my question is this. Is there something that's keeping you from asking them just to come on Wednesday night? I mean, <laughs> I mean, it, really? Are you afraid of what they'll say? What's the worst they could say? Well, you can't repeat it here, I know. But <laughs> I'm not talking about that, that worst. I'm just talking about like, no. They could just say no. No. They could say no in a polite way. They could say no in an impolite way. Who cares? Who cares? Just, just give that some thought. Again, we are not gauging this by how many people come, but we know it's about Dothan. The Lord has said. It's about what he wants to do in the city, not just in this church, but in the church he is building in this city and the harvest that is here and beyond. You know, a friend of mine sent me a post on Facebook this week, and it was a quote from John Wesley's journal that I'm sure I've read. I'm sure, I'm sure I've read this, but I had forgotten it. What a great reminder it was. But in that journal, he talked about an experience in prayer that they had. And he said, as we prayed, I can't you know, quote it verbatim, but it was clo this is close enough. As we prayed and waited on the Lord, about 2 o'clock in the morning, the glory of the Lord overwhelmed us. The presence of the Lord became so strong that all people there cried out before God and some fell on their faces before God. And so they worshiped the Lord with such great awe that the Lord had come in such a demonstrative way that their lives were changed. I'll tell you something, honey. We need more, not less of that. You know what I'm saying? And that's the kind of thing that is happening here. I don't know what you felt when we were singing, but I felt something. Okay? And some of you guys danced in here because you had such a great week so far. And some of you could barely get out of the car. I understand. You dragged in here, but you got here nonetheless. But once here, hey, there is a stream. There is a river. The presence of the Lord moving through this room. Moving right now through this room. Jesus inviting us, offering to relieve our burdens. Some of you are carrying very heavy burdens that you carried a long time. 
I've asked the Lord to sensitize us, all of us, to what he is saying to us about that. And as I share the thing the Lord laid on my heart tonight with you, I want to tell you I'm listening at the same time so that if there's something specific, even if for just one person, that that truth will set you free. You are not here by accident. You are not here by coincidence. Whether you felt it coming in or not, I believe with all my heart this is an appointment with the Holy Spirit to do in you what only He can do. Are you listening? That, that's good news to me. This afternoon, after I got here, the Lord gave me a cowboy poem. <laughs> Nobody's even heard this one. The name of it is Shameless. And that's what I'm preaching about tonight. At the auction that day, I decided to stay because I knew a horse they would sell. In fact, everyone knew, and his owners too. He wouldn't bring much, you could tell. Because he was so wild, it had been a while since anyone even would try to saddle him up. No one tried their luck because they were afraid they would die. This pony had fright, and oh, what a sight. When they let him into the ring, let's get him gone, the auctioneer's song. No one thought he'd bring a thing. The scars on this horse showed he'd suffered, of course. His owners had sure beaten him. Didn't like what I saw. Can't someone unthaw the coldness that is in some men? The bid was so low, we knew that he'd go to just make dog food and glue. But then a man raised up his hand. The bidding was not really through. He bought that mount and made the count, the price for the horse he did pay. We thought it strange how things can change as he led that pony away. Shame and disgrace were there on her face as they dragged her before him, caught in the act, could not fight back or justify all of her sin. Law says she dies, no second tries. Now what will your answer be? He wrote in the sand, and no one can say the words he wrote, you see. Then raised his hand and asked each man to cast the first stone at her face. If without sin, let the stoning begin. But each one stood there in his place. Then one by one, they made their run. They could not stand up to the test. He told her then, I forgive your sin. I am not like all the rest. Go, sin no more. You know the score. Here's a new life, don't you see? I lift your shame and all your pain. Go be all God wants you to be. Some are sold cheap, no way to keep away from their sin and their shame. But Jesus died, paid the price, we need to just call on his name. And oh yes, that horse in time learned the course. That over time he was taught. He's trained today and earns his pay, doing all things that he ought. Because someone cared and truly shared the way to start life anew. Good news, you see, for you and me. Believe it because it is true. Amen. Now then, the next few minutes I want to talk to you about shame. And in Hebrews chapter 12, by the way, I've never preached on this before, parts of it. It says in verse 1 through 2, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The encouragement here is to run our race and throw off everything that slows us down, especially the sin in your life that gives you a problem, what you might call recurring sins, besetting sins. 
But all the heavy things that you carry are things that God calls us to cast aside in this race. He wants to lighten our load. He wants to free us to run successfully in the power of the Holy Spirit. And the second part of that exhortation is focus on Jesus. You see, you can't beat that. You cannot beat that advice. Because if you focus on Jesus, you can see hope that you really can be free of your addictions, that you really can be healed of your hurts, that you really can overcome the things that nobody else thought you could overcome. There's hope when you look to Jesus. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finish of our faith, and then it describes what he did to help us relieve the burden. It says that he endured the cross for the joy that was set before him, despising the shame. Do you get that? He despised the shame. He despised the shame of the cross, but he went there anyway. You know, when Jesus died on the cross, they shamed him. It was a tragic, humiliating death. Do you follow that? And when Jesus went to the cross for us, he took all of our sin, but not only that, he took all of the shame that goes with sin because he despised it. Do you understand? He loves the sinner, but he hates the sin because he knows what the sin does to us. And he knows what shame does to us as well. Jesus died and was raised from the dead to forgive and deliver us from all our sin, all our hurts, and all our shame. I want to unpack the shame issue because this is what I know. Jesus, in moving in our lives, one of the greatest reliefs that you can ever experience is when he relieves your life from shame. So where does the shame come from? You know, some people don't have any shame, do they? <laughs> they do what they do and they're not ashamed of it and God, you know, God has something to say to people like that, okay? That want to flaunt their sin and want to brag about what is wrong. And there are a lot of people in our culture like that and God can deal with people like that. But, but you know, when it comes down to it, Shame goes along with sin, doesn't it? Isn't that the way it is? I mean, if you, if you really have any conscience, any sensibility about right and wrong, you don't fall into the category of the people who do wrong and don't care. I know there are people like that. I know that. And God can deal with them. But let's just stop for a minute and deal with the people who do the wrong thing and they know they've done wrong. If you do the wrong thing, if you sin against God and you know it, shame goes with it, doesn't it? Because you feel that way. You feel ashamed about what you've done. Now then, we've broken God's law. That's what sin is, right? Right? And so when it comes time to grow churches, this is what most people want to do. Not Ralph, but most preachers, the ones that he met with. No, I'm just kidding. I, I, I'm, not, I'm just kidding. But see, the way you grow churches is you don't go after people that are wrecked with sin. You go after people that have manageable sin. You know what I'm saying? That look normal. I mean, people that can show up for work and, you know, drive nice cars. And, you know what, we, we, want, we want people who are, who are not so dysfunctional, okay, to build the church. Because if you get enough people, you know, together that are really train wrecks, what have you got? You, man, you. And, you know, churches have a tendency to, to attract people that are unbalanced. Have you noticed that? Yeah, who are like, Wow. Where'd you do, didn't the Baptist want you or the, or the Presbyterians or somebody? I mean, couldn't you find a place with the Episcopalians? Or, or what about the wild charismatics? I mean, they love people like you. You're, you know, kind of weird. See, here's good news. Jesus takes people like us, like us, whose sins became unmanageable. You see, the... the, the the worst sin you could commit in, growing up in Montgomery, Alabama was embarrassing us. 
Mama said, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. She was right, okay? I mean, I, I can't fault mom for saying that. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. Well, why? Because she knew what I was doing, right? And trust me, I knew the difference between right and wrong, and I was ashamed of myself. That didn't stop me every time, but I did feel that shame. The other thing she would say regularly is, please try not to embarrass us. Because I had a tendency to do that too. Man, you know you're in trouble when your sin gets embarrassing. You know what I'm saying? When it's not discretionary anymore. When you can't hide it very well. When it gets out of control. So I'm a preacher that is standing here talking about shame. And the reason I can talk about it personally is because I have felt it. I have been desperately ashamed of what I have done. We say, well, Brad, what have you done? I mean, what, what have you done that you're so ashamed of? Well, just pick any commandment you like. You know, like the Big Ten. Okay? Those are not the ten suggestions. I say, well, how many have you broken? All of them. Really? That's pretty serious stuff in there, right? I mean, how serious do you think they are? Did you ever kill anybody? Yeah, sure did. Did you ever commit adultery, Brad? Yes, sure did. Did you lie? Oh, yeah, I lied. Were you an idolatrous person? Yes, I was. Did you steal? Oh, yeah, I've stolen. I've stolen, lied, committed adultery, worshipped other gods. I'm a Sabbath breaker. I've been envious of other people, too. There is no law of God I have not broken. Still want to listen to the rest of this? Well, let me tell you something. It's the truth. And I regret it. But I'm not ashamed anymore. I was because I should have been. Just as ashamed as Adam and Eve were when they ate the fruit God said don't eat, what did they do? They ran and hid, didn't they? Didn't they run and hide? That's because, why, would they, why did they run and hide? They were naked, they didn't know it before, now they knew it, and they were ashamed, weren't they? They ran away, God came looking for them, right? Let me tell you something, it's been like that all the way through. That story is my story, yours too, right? Did exactly what God said not to do, and what goes with it, shame. But when the Lord forgives us, He wants to take the shame away so you don't have to live the rest of your life in penance, okay, or as an apology. The Lord wants to actually create godly sorrow in us, not based on accusation, but based on conviction. And when the Holy Spirit, according to what Paul wrote, brings godly sorrow, you really see what Jesus did for you. You see the seriousness of your sin. You're brokenhearted by what breaks God's heart. He gives you godly sorrow, and what does that lead to? Repentance, real change. But shame does not. Because if you remain ashamed, you will fall into a cycle where you're constantly feeling condemned and you ultimately will fall back into your sin. Are you listening? You see, shame is a tool ultimately of the enemy, which we'll get to in just a minute, to keep you in bondage to what Jesus died to free you of. I know some people that have been forgiven, they're saved, they've received salvation, they love the Lord, but they're carrying this huge burden of shame because of what they did. They have such a history that is filled with regret that they are in bondage to that history, even though they've been given a new life. Come on! So are you going to live your life as an apology or are you going to live on purpose and boldly in the grace of God? I confess my sin to you this night. I'm not standing here because I'm not a lawbreaker. I'm standing here because I've been forgiven. If God can use a lawbreaker like me, maybe he could use you too, as weird as you are. 
The Lord said to me many times, and I got to be careful because, you know, there's David Nakovich from Fairhope, and there's Chris Perry and Wayne, and there's his beautiful wife, Colleen, and they're all from Fairhope. How about that? So they know me pretty well. But they also know and they've heard me say, God called me to preach to give hope to weird people. <laughs> yeah. So what disqualified you? What was it that, that, that God said, and then what did you say? Well, I can't do that. Well, why can't you? Why can't you do it? What have you done that disqualified you? What is it in your history that, that trumps the grace of God? You say, well, I've still got problems. <laughs> well, haven't we all? Humble yourself, you get some grace on those problems. So, so I want to say that, so I'm not going to stand here and tell you that all shame is inappropriate. Yeah, shame goes with sin, but when God forgives your sin, it's to empower you to overcome not just the sin, but the shame that goes with it. Now, I want to say this to you as well. The shame not only comes from some of the things we've done, but you know where some of us get our shame that we carry every day? We get it from our family and how we were raised. Is that true? You know, the Bible says that the sins of the fathers carry forward into future generations. I don't think anybody knows everything that that means. But here's my take on it, that whatever they raised you to believe was normal is what you think is normal. So if racism went from gener generation to generation in your family and you were taught that was normal, how did you know the difference when you were a little kid? You never knew the difference. And so what it does is it stacks the odds that you'll grow up to be a racist and pass that on to your children and grandchildren, unless, of course, the grace of God breaks that generational curse, interrupts it, changes you, and shows you the difference. So how did they raise you? I mean, were you raised in a positive, upbeat, spirit-filled uh, family where everybody praised the Lord and loved Jesus? If so, you got a big head start. Praise the Lord for it. But if you didn't, if you were handicapped rather than head started, in all likelihood, you still carry shame. And the way it's passed the strongest is verbally. Are you listening? Verbally. What did they say to you? about you. Growing up on the ranch, my folks were in the church. I went to church and school in town, grew up working on a ranch outside of town. There's always something to be doing on that ranch, working, working, working all the time. And one of the best things dad gave me was a work ethic. And one of the worst things dad gave me was a workaholic ethic. Thanks, dad. But anyway, dad was... Dad was a mixed bag. He wanted me in church. He was there with us in church. But he was one of these guys who was raised, obviously, by a very rough father. I never knew him, my grandfather. He died before I was born. That's my best guess. Dad never talked about him. But when Dad would send me to do something, it was impossible to please him. This couldn't please him. He'd say, okay, the fence down here in the pasture b below the barn has a place where the cattle are getting out. He had a special name for the cattle who were getting out that I really, it's not church language I can use, but for a long time I thought that word applied to cattle. <laughs> I even asked my mom, what kind of cow is, and it started with a B, and, and, and uh, she said, that's not a type, that's not like an Angus or a Hereford. That's, that's just what your dad calls cattle. Oh, okay. But anyway, go down there where they're getting out, Brad. Saddle your horse. Put your, your staples and such in the saddlebag. Get down there and fix that fence and do it right. And this, I'd be like 12, 13 years old, so I'd do exactly what he said, and I'd go down there and restretch the wire and tack it all up just the way I thought he wanted. And then he would come behind me, of course, to inspect that job. And invariably, he'd stand there with his hands on his hips. And the first thing he would say is, this is the nearest nothing I've ever seen. How do I remember that at 62? Well, he said it a lot. <laughs> it kind of got stuck in my brain. This is the nearest nothing I've ever seen. 
And then the second thing he would say is, how could you have been this stupid? What were you thinking? Are you out of your mind? And then the next thing he would say is another thing I can't say in church because it had a racial slur. Because he was a racist. And I cannot tell you how long I carried those scripts in my head. What did I want to hear from him? Exactly what you wanted to hear from your mother and your dad. That they loved you. That you could do it. That they were proud of you. That they encouraged you. That when you got it wrong, they forgave you and helped to teach you how to do it right. That's what parents do, right? Yeah. And when discipline is needed, yes, there's discipline, but it's not the kind of discipline that's harsh and demeaning that devalues you. It just gives you boundaries so you can be secure in their love and you get an idea that your heavenly father, though he disciplines you, loves you and that you are valued in his eyes. But if you didn't get that, then you got scripts in your head unless Jesus replaces those scripts that brought shame. You see, it brought shame to me. He shamed me when he degraded me like that. And as a very young man, I thought there was something wrong with me. I was so insecure about who I was. I felt so much inferiority about who I was. I was very, very uncomfortable in certain situations. I had no confidence at all. Why is that? Because in my head, I was not the one who could get the job done no matter how hard I tried. What could you have been thinking? How could you be this stupid? That's what was in my head. Now then, good news. Jesus interrupted that in my mind and in my heart. It took a while. But he lifted that burden of shame when I found out that ultimately it didn't matter what my dad said, it mattered more what my heavenly father said. It didn't matter what he thought. It mattered what God thought. His truth would set me free. He would relieve my shame. I could do anything he said. It's a wonderful thing when you know that God is willing to entrust you with an assignment because he knows that with his grace you can get it done. Even you, even you who have broken his law and disqualify yourself and were talked out of God's best by the very people who were trying to show you the way. I made peace with dad. I forgive dad. He got saved before he died. Praise the Lord, he's in heaven with Jesus. Hallelujah. But I'm determined in the name of Jesus to speak life into my children. He taught me how not to do that. Pretty much all I got to do is the opposite of what he did, and it'll work out. Where else do you get your shame? It's not just from your folks. You get it from people, too. Not just people you kin to. All those people that were important enough to you that what they said mattered to you. Who was that? Your coach? Your pastor? Who was that? Your teacher? <laughs> Who was your, your scout leader? Some friend that you loved? Maybe your spouse. You know what I'm saying? Not mom and dad now. This is the broader circle. What did they say? You know, some of those people want to keep you where you used to be. They cannot see you the way you really are and who you're going to be. They see you through the old lens, don't they? Not as a new creation, but as someone who will never be what God really wants you to be. That's because they see you through the lens of your addiction. All right? So in, your, in their mind, you'll always be like that. And particularly if you hurt them or disappointed them along the way. So, hey, man, that's just life, isn't it? So what did they say to you? What did they speak? What accusation did they make? And you accepted it. You remember that woman that caught, was caught in adultery this poem is about? Do you really think the Pharisees gave a rip about her? They didn't, did they? What were they trying to do? They were using her to accuse Jesus. 
Now, I want to tell you something. The Holy Spirit is not an accuser. The Holy Spirit is not an accuser. He's a convictor. He's a persuader. Okay? He's also a comforter and a reliever, but he is no accuser. I don't know, I don't know about you, but my, my discernment on that is those Pharisees had the wrong spirit. Because all they wanted to do was trap Jesus and accuse him, and they used this poor sinful woman, and was she wrong? Was she wrong? <laughs> yeah. Sure she was wrong, so she made it easy for them, right? I mean, people who are living the wrong way make it easy for the people who want to judge everybody, don't they? Right? So they caught her in the very act. How did that happen? I don't know. What about the man? I don't know. Where was he? Why didn't they drag him in too? I don't know. But they got her. And they drag her in front of Jesus to make an accusation against Jesus. And what do you think she felt? Shame. Embarrassment. Painful, isn't it? Can you see that in your mind? And so the law says she dies. The law says she's worthy of death. Why? Because she broke God's law. Who's broken God's law? Don't get too excited here. All of us right? Broke God's law, worthy of death. What do you say? And you know what he said. Let him without sin cast the first stone. Great answer, don't you think? <laughs> yeah. And they all left. Where are your accusers? I don't see any of them. He said, I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. That's good news. Do you hear me? You see the difference? One was an accusation. The other was not. It was compassion that spoke the truth. What was the compassion? I don't judge you. What was the truth? Go and sin no more. We speak the truth in love. That's how we grow up. Hey, the good news is this. What other people say about you is not what really matters the most. What matters the most? what God says about you and how you respond to it. And if God calls out your sin, it's not an accusation, it's a conviction. You respond how? By confessing it to the Lord and being forgiven, right? It brings forgiveness. And if it persists, what do you do? Find somebody you trust and confess it to them too and let them pray for you so you can be healed. He'll forgive you the minute you confess it. If you want to overcome it, sometimes you've got to get a partner and say, hey, help me with this thing. But we pray for one another, we confess to one another, we can be healed. That's different from setting yourself up as the judge of others. Listen to me. Nobody's going to come to Jesus if you become a legalist and give them nothing but law. But they will come to Jesus if you speak the truth in love. And that's what will set you free too. And one last little thing. And that is the shame not only comes when we sin or when we have parents that don't get it or when we listen to the influencers that want to accuse. But you know the enemy is the accuser of the brethren, isn't he? Isn't that what it says? The enemy himself. And he uses, he uses parents that don't know how to pass a blessing. And he uses the influence of people who don't know how to speak the truth in love. But I want to tell you something. The voice in your head tonight that is telling you that the good news only applies to other people and you're the one exception that cannot be free, that's a lie. And he's just trying to accuse you to do what? Keep you out of the blessing. And what does it say about that in the Scripture? The Scriptures tell us that we overcome the accuser of the brethren, the enemy, by the blood of the lamb, okay? What does that mean? He can't accuse me of what I've been forgiven of. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I remove that because I don't operate with legalism anymore. I operate with grace. It's not a license to sin. It's freedom from sin. Do you hear me? It's the power to say no to the wrong things and yes to the right things, to live a righteous life by the grace of God and to deflect the accusation of the enemy. The enemy comes with his accusations. I'm washed in the blood of the Lamb. He cannot get past the blood of the Lamb, folks. He can't get past the blood. And what else? The word of your testimony. I mean, isn't it great that even the devil himself can't argue with your testimony? What is your testimony? I was this, now I'm this. Hallelujah. If 
by the grace of God. And we don't care if we die. <laughs> we don't care if we die. It's kind of like, hey man, the devil starts acting up. I mean, you know, bring on your worst. Worst thing you can do is kill me and then I win. <laughs> Hallelujah. Not scared of it. Guy sent me a Facebook video this week and it's a little song about dancing on my grave. Why? Because the grave has no more sting and death cannot bite me anymore. Why? Because, hey, I'm already dead. I died in Jesus and I'm alive in Him and I, do, I can look death in the eye. I can look trials. I can see past the tragedy. I can overcome the temptation. I don't have to put up with the devil's nonsense. I can overcome in Jesus' name by the blood of the Lamb and the word of my testimony and I don't care if I die. So there it is. So there it is. So, so hey. Shame free, right? Shameless. But in a good way. Right? So, so now wait a minute. You just going to go home and eat? I mean, really. I mean, is that it? Is that what it's going to be? Are you going to carry that thing out with you? That you brought in? Please. You know, I can see it. I'm going to tell you, I can see what's in there. Not to embarrass you, but I can see what, they, what your mother said to you when you were too little to even understand it. She shouldn't have done that. She, did not, she should not have spoken the words she said. She should not have said it the way she said it. And your dad, he should not have been that way. You're going to have to forgive him. You're going to have to forgive him. That was the way he was raised. No excuses, but that's what was happening. You know what? There's some, there's some women in here, not to embarrass you, but I want to tell you, you were sexually abused and you have carried the shame of that your whole life. And you've told yourself over and over and over again that it doesn't matter. But you have not been able to get free of that burden. And I want you to know, I want you to know, you don't have to leave here with that shame anymore. Jesus died to make it so please, please lay your burden down and let him do what only he can do. Stand with me, will you? Okay, now, Lord, now we say, do what you can do about this shame problem we have. Where we've sinned, help us to repent and be cleansed once and for all. And where we've taken that load, that burden of shame and carried it, even long after you forgave us. Help us to lay aside the weight finally and hear you replace the lie that is in our minds with the truth of your word. I pray for deliverance. I pray for healing. I pray for salvation. I pray for every manifestation of grace you want to bring, Lord. We throw open the door. As the band sings and worships and as you worship, this altar is open for you. Come and be set free of your shame tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.
I wanna know 